always thinking of new dreams. George Lucas. George Lucas is an acclaimed American filmmaker. He has directed six feature films. THX 1138, 1971, American Graffiti, 1973, Star Wars, 1977, Skipping the 80s, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, 1999, and then two more films in what is called the prequel trilogy, 2002's Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith in 2005. Starting in the mid-60s, Lucas made nine short films before his feature film debut. Almost all of them are documentaries or experimental, or some combination of the two. The documentary angle comes up later in his career when Lucas almost directed Apocalypse Now as a fiction documentary hybrid in the style of medium cool. He wanted to film parts of it during the actual Vietnam War. The studio thought this was uh, not a good idea. His early work in documentaries to his final films form a complete arc from shooting documentary films in the real world to the other extreme of a primarily computer-generated digital movie. There is also in his career an arc from making experimental films with an adversarial attitude to the business side of the industry, to redefining pop culture with some of the most successful movies ever made, to building his own studio for independence, and then finally selling it to Disney. A staggeringly complete arc for Mr. Lucas. In his final short film, he himself in 1968 filmed Francis Ford Coppola saying the following sentence. The world is filled with guys who said, well, I'm going to make the money and then make the personal films. And somehow they never get around to doing it. Interesting. Well, uh, let's keep that in mind for some reason. His first narrative short film, Freiheit, is a simple student film about a man fleeing a totalitarian regime. He runs and is gunned down. It's an adolescent musing on the desire for freedom, a theme which will anchor all three of the films he directed in the 1970s. In Freiheit, you have a guy running away from totalitarianism and towards death slash freedom. In his first feature film, THX 1138, the character is running away from a techno dystopia and into not death exactly, but rather into the unknown. His second film, American Graffiti, is about remembering wanting to run away from something you took for granted at the time. Your youth, your friends, your hometown, the era you grew up in. It's a nostalgia for the yearning and trepidation that comes with leaving a life behind. On the other side of the escape is not just another world, but another you, adulthood, a time when all of it will be a memory. And his third film, Star Wars, an old legend from another world, combines all of this. A young person leaves his hometown to confront a great technological evil. Let's talk about his first movie, THX 138, or Thex, as he likes to be called. Thex is a bold movie. It drops you into a cold, bizarre world without guiding you through What's it. What's wrong? Never mind. There's almost no exposition, and there's not much relatability to the characters. It primarily works off of theme and sensation. We're invited to consider the complicity of religion and consumerism, or the violence of the state. The hero ultimately escapes because catching him becomes unprofitable. Are you now, or have you ever been, is spoken aloud several times, a reference to the infamous HUAC committee's question about whether or not someone had been a communist. The X-1138 is a bold movie. It's also a uh, bald movie. A hippie nightmare, no hair anywhere. Even the kids are bald. There is a little voiceover that talks about how the changes to society were so gradual that people didn't really notice, but overall, this vision of the future is not explained, it's an extrapolation of contemporary anxieties. Like the way things are headed, I tell ya, before you know it, we'll be uh, numb, drugged, alone, unable to have authentic connection because everything we do is under surveillance. The most naturalistic sounding dialogue in the movie is two off-screen guys talking shop about their weird brain-modifying job. What, what is the, the real dope on the cortex bond problem anyway. Oh, you find yourself with- There's a whole spectrum between bits that have aged poorly, 
bits that enjoyably date the film to the specific socio-political moment in which it was made, and some bits that still resonate. The holographic entertainment is either sexual, brutal police violence, or extremely corny. Technological progress without social progress. And should we defeat every enemy, and should we double our wealth and conquer the stars, and still be unequal to this issue, then we will have failed as a people and as a nation. Yeah, we're gonna be staying on the moon, but there's still gonna be races. So, in the end, are we really winning? These nuclear bombs, nuclear war, what's going on? And if all that wasn't enough trouble, there's a dang lizard in the computer room. What's that lizard doing in there? Every question you've ever had about the IT lizard will be answered in a Disney Plus limited series. They could do this. They do own the rights. The world of Fex is one without warmth or authenticity. Even the sex scene plays with this music under it. The film lacks the recognizable humanity and tonal contrast, which might be necessary to feel more invested in it. It might be more terrifying to have shown human beings having adapted to these conditions and to have our nature more recognizable. That the life provided by the overlords does have its satisfactions, and so the character is actually losing something by rejecting it. Or you could present a society that seems at least kind of good at first, and then the viewer realizes as they learn more, oh, this is not so good. Those are all common moves that subsequent dystopian films would do, and their absence in Thex does create an interesting experience, and like I said, bold. There are strong visual forebears to his later films. This scene in particular of Thex messing up at his job uses a similar visual language to the space battles in Star Wars. You have the main character using some kind of a controller, various screens and graphics, some interested parties chiming in with sportscaster-style exposition. Traversing a seemingly endless white room, traversing a seemingly endless desert, waving to distant people. Techno-fascists make small talk. They must be somewhere in group. You know what's going on? Operation 5 Proto-Jawas near the exit. Watching a broadcast. All of Lucas's feature films are visions of another world, motivated by a variety of impulses and looking in different directions. Where were you going? Nowhere. Will you mind if I come along? His second film, American Graffiti, is a nostalgic look at a world only 10 years before, the world of his youth, which was changed by impending events hinted at in the film, the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, it has some of the particularity of memory, like this bit when he meets Wolfman Jack and their refrigerator is busted, so he's eating a popsicle. Gotta eat them all before they melt. And he encourages Kurt to eat one too. Kurt declines. I think this kind of puts out the idea of enjoying something before it's gone. Don't wait. But it also has the kind of particularity I like. The film also has the gloss and fantasy of a memory. It feels idealized. It feels like a whole adolescence of anecdotes packed into one night. American Graffiti emerged from the collaborative, fertile ground of American cinema in the 70s. After Thex 1138, Francis Ford Coppola challenged Lucas to make a comedy. He had the help of brilliant people consulting on the visuals, and as with Thex, Walter Murch on the sound editing. The sound in this movie is as thoughtful and dialed in as Thex or Star Wars, but it depicts a real world and real things. The diegetic radio and pop soundtrack threads the multiple plot lines together, and the environmental context, whether it's a field in the woods or a high school gymnasium, is always present in the mix. Early 60s pop music drenched in reverb sounds like person pitch. It stands apart in his filmography for a feeling of life and spontaneity. Some of that energy would continue on into the original Star Wars movie, but disappear after that. American Graffiti was a huge hit, one of the most successful movies of all time, especially in consideration of its small budget. It kicked off a wave of 60s nostalgia. There's probably an inevitability to that nostalgia showing up in culture, so it's hard to say whether or not American Graffiti created it 
or pioneered it, but I think it's fair to say that Lucas created a fantasy world from his past, and what he picked and how he depicted it molded the way that nostalgia would be expressed in film. Hey, your God, girl, really put out. <laughs> That influence would carry on past even depicting that specific era. Like here's John Singleton talking about how American graffiti influenced Boys in the Hood. You know, I think I could really credit George Lucas for inspiring me to become a filmmaker. All these different stories in intertwining told a whole spectrum of what it was to be young in America and trying to find yourself. And I tried to do that in Boys in the Hood. Listen. I want to do something with my life, right? Like Fex, American Graffiti ends with the protagonist leaving his world behind. Maybe Fex also becomes a writer in Canada. Why not? Canada's probably still around. I hope. Wait a minute. A writer in Canada? Hmm. Let's remember that for later, huh? Star Wars. Star Wars, Lucas' third film, is an adjustment and synthesis of his first two. The combination of futurism and nostalgia is set up perfectly by the first lines. You have the oppressive technological force of Thex, but now the counterforce is not a lone figure, but organized human resistance. The sheer amount of weird stuff that we're shown in the opening section of Star Wars is pretty astounding. Almost every shot has something as intriguing as Thex's legendary IT lizard, with very little explanation. We get the sense that humanity is lost in the jumble of its own creations. We've given our humanity to robots, and we've turned ourselves into machines. The viewer can't understand about half the dialogue in the opening section of the film. It's all bleeps and bloops and creature speak. By the time that we reach Luke and his aunt and uncle, it's a sigh of relief, a return to the restless youth of American Graffiti. Luke's friends are already gone. He's stuck in a mundane life that is nonetheless interesting and strange to us. Luke leaves his home behind, but he doesn't have much of a choice. His aunt and uncle are killed by the Empire. In the end, the Empire's genocidal weapon is destroyed by collective effort, by a princess who would rather die than compromise with authoritarianism, by a skeptical mercenary who in the key moment chooses his friends and the cause over himself, by beyond the grave wisdom from the spirit of a martyr, and by a farm boy who learns to trust spiritual intuition over technology. None of them can do it alone, and they don't get along easily. It takes convincing, it takes struggling together. Star Wars is a thrilling story, told in a genuinely spectacular fashion. Twenty years later, The Phantom Menace abandons most of what makes the original Star Wars such a compelling film, such as a simple existential conflict between clearly defined good and evil. In the original Star Wars, the evil is really evil. It tortures, it kills, it mass murders. After the Death Star destroys a whole planet, Obi-Wan feels all those people dying in a moment and says the following line. I felt a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. <laughs> When I was a kid, this line felt kind of epic and mystical, but as an adult, thinking about the mechanized horrors of the 20th century, the same that haunt the work of Roy Anderson, it's really unsettling. Some of the style and the name Stormtroopers evoke the Nazis, while the accents of these older British actors evoke the British Empire, another great evil. In the original Star Wars, the axis of conflict is entirely centered around the plans to the Death Star and the desire of the Empire to use it to destroy the Rebellion and the Rebellion to destroy the Death Star. Every beat of the plot is advancing this story. With The Phantom Menace, even after three paragraphs of exposition, I don't understand what the conflict is actually over. How does a tax dispute lead to the Trade Federation blockading this particular planet? The Federation are upset about taxes, so they invade Naboo as some kind of a protest? Does Naboo here stand in for the Republic? Just a well-liked planet that they can get attention by occupying? Is this a hostage-taking situation? What does the Federation want? Lower taxes? We never see them demand this in the film itself. It's only mentioned in the opening text. They actually pretend that the invasion isn't happening at all. Outrageous. I object to the Senator's statements. 
while also trying to get the queen to sign a piece of paper to make the invasion legal. Now, this whole thing is a ruse. It's a political move by Palpatine to force a crisis to dislodge the Chancellor, and so that he can become Chancellor. The real reason they invaded Naboo, of all places, is because Palpatine is the senator from that planet and wants, like, the sympathy vote to become Chancellor. And they end up voting him as Chancellor. But him being involved in the conflict, to me, makes it uniquely unlikely he'd be voted as the new Chancellor. Because he's not exactly in a position to speedily mediate the conflict, he's part of it. So on one layer, you have sort of shoddy false flagmanship, like a ruse that doesn't really work, it has too many holes in it that people would see through immediately, or at least be asking a lot of inconvenient questions. And then underneath the intrigue, the dramatic conflict is, in my opinion, implausible. This element, which was poorly handled and feels a bit out of place, was, interestingly, one of the core ideas. In 1983, Lucas described what he envisioned for the prequels as altogether different in look and tone from the existing trilogy. They will be more melodramatic, showing the political intrigue and Machiavellian plotting that led to the downfall of the Noble Republic. They will only have enough outward action to keep the plot moving. This intention is at odds with most of what the final film is, which is a toyetic kids adventure movie. Variations on this altogether different look and tone do continue on throughout the prequels, with the noir intrigue of Attack of the Clones and the tragic melodrama of Revenge of the Sith. The films themselves, though, continue to be tonally incoherent. I saw Revenge of the Sith opening weekend at a packed theater full of hardcore fans, and at the climactic moment of grief and pain as Anakin realizes that his attempt to gain power to save the one he loves has actually killed her, The audience laughed. In the original Star Wars film, we have archetypal characters with personalities played enthusiastically by a great cast. They bicker, they joke, they have crushes on each other. The spark of life carries over from American Graffiti, and it's really crucial to the film working. The Phantom Menace takes two big swings with a slapstick cartoon character and a child actor. Neither of those are easy to pull off in general, but that these performances got into the actual final film is... I'm a person, and my name is Anakin. Now, leaking in here, all sinking and no power? When they use a thinking we set in trouble! <sighs> Jar Jar or Anakin might have made sense as the lead character because they have something of a normal life to be torn from and thrown into an adventure, and they're outsiders to the whole machinations of the galactic politics. They're the two characters who undergo the biggest change in status by the end of the story. Anakin from a slave to a Jedi apprentice, and Jar Jar from an outcast to a hero. But the film isn't really set up to get us to identify with either of them. The performances make that impossible anyway, but structurally it isn't exactly doing it either. And the rest of the human characters could best be described as professionals doing their jobs. The other day I was in a thrift store and I happened to see the Phantom Menace novelization. I read the first page, and it was actually about Anakin, who doesn't show up in the movie for the first 30 minutes. This reminded me of how the original Star Wars has a deleted scene which shows Luke watching the opening space battle. I think it's vaguely interesting how this somewhat unconventional move of not introducing the protagonist until a little ways into the film seems to have been arrived at in editing for the original Star Wars, and in the case of The Phantom Menace, sort of second-guessed by the novelization. The original Star Wars gives us a luxurious opening section to just inhabit the world, the fly on the wall part, and then we latch onto a relatable human character who moves within that world. The opening act of The Phantom Menace is almost constant movement and action in place of either character or world building. So none of the action feels dangerous and the world doesn't feel real because we're sort of breezing through it. Watching a 4K fan restoration of the original 1977 version of Star Wars, it really looks fantastic. The effects have aged, but it doesn't break the immersion, because you've got our old friend, visual coherence. The problem with using CGI for the main characters is that it is a digital cartoon, so the more it ages, the more the film looks like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but without a story reason for why those different realities are coexisting. After I had already written that comparison, I found a clip where they actually talk about exactly this issue and use the exact same reference point. The audience is watching Liam Neeson, and they've got Jar Jar there. And Liam Neeson is real, 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 real. 
And then we have to come up and make ours as real, because if we don't, the audience will pick up on it immediately and say, there's something about that that's not, I don't believe that. Yeah. So you're out of the movie. It looks, yeah. it looks like Roger you're Rabbit. You yeah. can't have it be like Roger Rabbit. The sequence in The Phantom Menace, which feels inspired and alive in the filmmaking, is the obvious. One of his early short films is a race car driver doing a circuit to qualify for a match. I found this kind of moving, considering Lucas's early obsession with cars and racing. He was in a near-fatal accident as a teenager. Surviving it seems to have reoriented his life and given him the impetus to dive into the arts. This short film was inspired by the work of Quebecois filmmaker Jean-Claude Lebrecq, particularly his short film, 60 Cycles. Lebrecq, being a pivotal early influence on Lucas, is just one of many astounding connections between Quebec and Star Wars, all of which will be detailed in great detail at the end of this video for reasons that will become clear at the end of this video. With no dialogue or a traditional story, this early work falls into the experimental style that Lucas would always yearn to return to. All of Lucas's main characters, if only they can pilot their vehicles well enough, with enough speed, maybe they can break into the unknown, or win their freedom from slavery, or even just a feeling of freedom. Or maybe they can stab the dark heart of an oppressive force. So why did he skip the 80s as a feature film director? Star Wars was a grueling shoot, filmed in different parts of the world in extreme environments and on massive sets. Making the film required them to invent a ton of special effects techniques and build the company, Industrial Light and Magic, to pull it all off. So it wasn't just normal burnout from directing this beast, it was also that the film was a massive success and that gave Lucas the opportunity to continue with the infrastructure building side of the pursuit. It wasn't the regular life cycle of making a film, in some ways, it never really ended because he was never just directing a film. Star Wars required more. He was also heavily involved in the Star Wars sequels, but more on the story and production side. Here he is talking about putting together a complex visual effects sequence for The Empire Strikes Back. And I cut this really while I was here, while they were still shooting in England. I was here and I cut the snow battle and did all the animatics and all that kind of stuff. He was even more involved in Return of the Jedi, saying, I hadn't realized that, you know, ultimately it's probably easier for me to do these things and to farm them out. Because it was even more complex than the last one, I really did have to end up being there every day on the set and working very closely with Richard and shooting second unit. And there was really more work than I thought it was going to be. In the 80s, Lucas also created Indiana Jones. Pixar started at his company before he sold it to Steve Jobs. And he was a producer on a truly eclectic bunch of films. Including Kagamusha by Kurosawa, Paul Schrader's Mishima film, Willow, Howard the Duck. He was also managing the Star Wars licensing machine, toys, trading cards, video games. He has story credits on made-for-TV Ewok movies. The hell was going on in the 80s, man? His eventual return to directing with The Phantom Menace was a special cultural moment. I guess the most anticipated movie ever made, and an independently financed one at that. Of course, the Lucas that returned was changed by his 20 odd years of being a businessman and a champion of technology. In the 70s, Lucas was working in the context of a creative community of artists. By the 90s, he was a multimillionaire living in a Xanadu, surrounded by people on his payroll. While the screenplay for The Phantom Menace seems to maybe actually have gotten worse with subsequent drafts,
The script for the original Star Wars had uncredited rewrites and important input from a host of other people, including his wife and editor, Marsha Lucas. Marsha has an impressive resume as an editor, which includes the previously mentioned Medium Cool, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Taxi Driver, and all three of George's films from the 70s. She also apparently made small but key contributions to the story of Star Wars, like suggesting the death of Obi-Wan. She also supported them financially with her editing work until American Graffiti became a huge hit. By the beginning of the 80s, they both wanted to take a break from filmmaking and raise children, and adopted a daughter in 1981. But now, suddenly living in a mansion with servants, Marcia said, getting here was a lot more fun than being here. Success is a very difficult thing. It's much more difficult than one might think. As they finished Return of the Jedi, George Lucas described the effect of the project on his life, telling Time Magazine, The sacrifice I've made for Star Wars may have been greater than I wanted. Star Wars has grabbed my life and taken it over against my will. Now I've got to get my life back again, before it's too late. But the changes success brought and the non-stop work of the 70s was just too much for their marriage to survive. They divorced, and George became a single father. I mean, I gave up directing in order to become a dad. You know, for 15 years, directing. I just ran a company and was an innovator, but it was uh, not doing what I really like to do, which was actually make movies. George Lucas and Roy Anderson are only a year apart in age. So they were 36 and 37 years old, respectively, in 1980, and they were both, to some extent, raising children in the 80s. Look, I don't want to turn this into a contest of who was the more present father in the lives of their children, but I've been confronted with evidence, and it's relevant to the whole skip in the 80s thing. Han är inte riktigt en familjeperson. Han lever ju lite som en ensam person som jobbar. Så det är nog lite svårt att ha en relation med honom i längden. Roy Anderson was maybe more busy doing his commercial and short film work, rebuilding his career, while Lucas seems to have been a workaholic up until adopting kids, at which point his priorities changed, according to comments like this. The moment my first daughter was born, Amanda, it was just like a bolt of lightning hit me. From that moment on, that became my first priority. I didn't think it was going to be, because before that, making films were my first priority, and that was what I was immersed in, and that was my life. But then I realized that this was my life. Filmmaker director, storyteller, writer, uh, technological innovator. Um, what do you want the first line of your obituary to say? That was a great dad. Yeah. Or I tried. <laughs> and some extremely not staged footage of him actually being a dad. Marsha Lucas has been quoted as saying, by the time George could afford to have a film facility, he no longer wanted to direct. After Star Wars, he insisted, I'm never going to direct another establishment type movie again. I used to say, for someone who wants to be an experimental filmmaker, why are you spending this fortune on a facility to make Hollywood movies? We edited Thex in our attic. We edited American Graffiti over Francis's garage. I just don't get it, George. If his goal was independence, was all the empire building even necessary? Look at Roy Anderson. At the exact same time this was going on with Lucas, he built a studio where he had complete artistic control and developed it in service of a truly unique cinematic vision. While it was never easy to finance his films, Anderson had to take out big personal loans, he managed to assemble financing from the various European film commissions and funds and everything. This kind of support for the arts doesn't really exist in the United States, but Lucas has been a multimillionaire or billionaire since the late 70s. A more experimental film in the vein of Thex 138, which tells a story through sound and image and music, an experiential picture. After all this research, I have to say that it is actually surprising to me that he didn't leverage his success into doing a film like that. Not just because he talked about it so much, but his filmography feels incomplete without it. It probably would have happened in the early 90s. It would get mixed positive reviews, but then become a cult classic, the cool George Lucas film, and then push him towards the commercially safer option of the prequels. I did at long last find a clip of him talking about the moment that he made this choice and why. Uh, my son was old enough, he was about five years old, that I thought I could go back and um, 
direct again. And uh, so then I was sort of faced with this decision about what I was going to do. Was I going to go back uh, and finish the kinds of movies and do the kinds of movies that I had started out doing, which was sort of the where I would have gone if I hadn't gone to American Graffiti and if I continued the THX idea, the sort of San Francisco avant-garde scene, you know, in the more pure cinema, more visually oriented kinds of films. Uh, or would I go back at that point and finish Star Wars, do this this backstory, which I never really intended to do and wasn't written as a movie and which technically couldn't be done when I finished uh, Return of the Jedi. But now, you know, 15 years later, uh, I had the technology. ILM had developed uh, digital technology to a point after Jurassic Park that I could actually consider doing some of the things that were uh, thought about in the backstory. And so I said, well, do I finish Star Wars or do I go off and do these other things? Um, you know, I knew if I went off and did these other things, I'll probably never go back to Star Wars and that would be the end of it. And action! The challenge of using the visual effects infrastructure he'd been building for almost 20 years to do the prequels was itself a step into unknown terrain, but of a different nature. It felt like now or never for doing more Star Wars, but with hindsight and an outside perspective, it appears to have been then or never for doing another film like Fex. From all the way back to 1974 to today, Lucas has continually stated his intention to return to experimental films. He's going to write and direct a new movie about caring, he says. Now, do you think you would ever direct another movie other than a, a science fiction type one? Sure. Like an American graffiti yeah, I'm, type one. I'm not, I'm going to start going back to directing other kinds of movies as soon as I finish the third one of these. And I wanted to go on and do other things, uh, things in philanthropy and doing more experimental kind of films. Started out in experimental films and I want to go back to experimental films. A series of small personal films, you've said. That's what right. you want to do. No more great Star Wars kind of adventure for George Lucas. No, no. That's over. Yeah. These are little tiny movies that are experimental. Are you interested in remo uh, going back to experimental films of your youth? That is exactly what I'm doing. Because, uh, again, I'm tired of all my friends, all those people, who say, well, George, when are you going to go back to experimental films? You keep saying you're going to do this. When are you going to do it? Well, I got, you know, I keep getting these opportunities. I kind of have to do them. Well, I want to see your experimental films. I don't, you know, why are you doing this? And so. Um, and I've, I have always wanted to do it. That's why I keep saying, I, you know, well, after I finish this, I'll do it. After I finish Star Wars, then I'll do it. Well, then I had to continue it because it was successful. The world is filled with guys who said, well, I'm going to make the money and then make the personal films. And somehow, they never get around to doing it. During this stretch of time, from the late 70s to the mid-90s, the time that he took a break from directing, commercial cinema was undergoing a huge change, partially driven by the work that he was still doing. His friend and collaborator Steven Spielberg continued to push the blockbuster, in tandem with the emerging digital technology of industrial light and magic. The huge profit and minimum risk of a well-known franchise emerged as the formula which slowly took over the industry. As this was developing, there was still a strong element of innovation, new stories and technology coming together to create a new experience. But this aspect, for the big studios, proved unnecessary to get reliably huge profits. The essence of it is marketing first. In 1997, George Lucas released the original trilogy of Star Wars films back into theaters for their 20th anniversary. These were not straight remasters of the original films, but rather updated edits, called the Special Editions. The most noticeable change was the addition of, at the time, cutting-edge computer graphics. Combined with the effects techniques of the 70s and early 80s, the films became jarringly incoherent visually. These bits of additional computer graphics have been updated over the years and further edits have been made, such as inserting an actor from the prequels into the ending of Return of the Jedi. 
The character of Han Solo is established as an expensive, arrogant criminal who's being chased after by bounty hunters. He does the laser gun version of a sucker punch and flips the barman a space coin. Cool stuff that makes his eventual turn into a hero of the cause all the more compelling. In the special edition, to soften his anti-hero aspect, the villain fires his laser gun. Han Solo dodges it and then fires back. This change itself has been softened over the years to the two basically shooting at the same time. Though these changes did not improve the films, the special editions were a huge hit at the box office, showing the power, even decades later, of a beloved franchise. But others will win Star Wars trilogy t-shirts, posters, and comic books. In a fascinating television documentary about Lucas after THX 1138 failed at the box office, but before he rebounded with American Graffiti, he talks presciently about this dynamic. The problem is that making film is an art. Selling film is a business. Right. The trouble is that they don't know how to sell films. Uh -huh. As a result, they try to make you make films that people will go to without them having to be sold, uh -huh. which is the real key to the problem. And if they weren't so backward and, you know, I mean, they just, if, it's, if, it, if they can't put a film in a theater and have people rush to the door, they're not interested. Well, they only, you know, this is the man who would later, according to producer Gary Kurtz and Harrison Ford, refuse to kill Han Solo because it would hurt the toy sales, and who self-funded The Phantom Menace by pre-selling the rights to the toys. Francis Ford Coppola said, Star Wars robbed America of one of its most challenging filmmakers. But many of Lucas's contemporaries faltered, temporarily or permanently, in the transition into the 80s. Even if Star Wars hadn't taken over his career, who knows what would have happened. Let's imagine for a moment if Star Wars had only been a moderate hit, enough to keep his career going, but not enough to make more. Would it be worth losing The Empire Strikes Back, an amazing film, to see what else he would have done as a director? I might make that trade. Now it's like the scene at the end of Come and See, except he's undoing all the Star Wars stuff that's been made since 1977. The marketing saturation of The Phantom Menace was all-absorbing for a 10-year-old. I remember it being on the cover of both Time Magazine and Time Magazine for Kids, which Ace Ambender's mom used to read to our class on Fridays. I remember three different fast food chains running commercials. You're a real colonel, right? Play Defeat the Dark Side. Get a game medallion and you could win one of millions of prizes instantly. Even a Star Wars speeder. Only a Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC. Weird Al's The Saga Begins. A long, long time ago. I remember taping the trailer off of television and then showing it to my class. I remember a local news story, I swear to God, before the film came out, about how the eye line when they're talking to Jar Jar was off. Greg Rossi saw the movie the morning that it came out and then spoiled it for us. Darth Maul? Dead. Qui-Gon? Dead, he told us. I thought he was kidding, and plus I already thought that this shot from the trailer would be the final shot of the movie, so I ignored him. In Vietnam, in 2016, I saw repackaged, unsold Phantom Menace toys. And look at this weird Phantom Menace-related CD-ROM I found in the basement of my mom's house. I have no memory of this disc. Star Wars games I played as a kid. X-Wing, TIE Fighter, Dark Forces 1, 2. Rebel Assault, Rebellion, Yoda Stories, Shadows of the Empire. What does it all mean? Rumor Lane, I didn't expect to Who find the likes of you here. Did I leave something of myself behind in these spare digital worlds? Does any trace remain along the superhighways of July?
when anyone can count. It has become an inescapable phenomenon. I could have been Star Wars kid. But the Star Wars kid, he's Quebecois from Quebec. He speaks French. Je me mets devant la caméra, puis là, par fatigue ou par frustration. Mais ça oublié aussi se faire horrible chose à Missy. Horrible chose si Missy apparaît dans les parages. Quebec held its first referendum on seceding from Canada on May 20th, 1980. One day later, George Lucas released The Empire Strikes Back. Un francophone, un Québécois canadien. Oh, C'est certain. Euh, un Québécois d'expression canadienne, française, française. George Lucas skipped the 80s as a feature film director. Legendary and reclusive Québécois novelist, screenwriter, lyricist, Réjean Ducharme. He also skipped the 80s. Dans la baie de Frobisher, blanc les loups, blanc les loups, blanc les loups, blanc. The problem is that the studios used to be owned by people who cared about the movie. Now they're corporations. They don't love movies, they don't go to movies, they don't know what a movie is. And they do focus groups to try to determine who will go see a movie. What if someone else beside you came to you and said, I want to make episode seven? Could you see that happening? No. No, absolutely, positively, you're really at closing the door without right. any wiggle room whatsoever. Right. There is no episode seven. I don't think everything should be this big blown out uh, super uh, kind of movie that I stumbled into. It's definitely not what I meant to do. And um, I just sort of followed it to the end. You called it a detour. It is a detour. It only is a 30 year detour. <laughs> they are making up our sentences as we go along. We know that no one outside here knows what's happening. And now we know that when they say we are being released, we are being transferred to some other prison 